Today I'm going to discuss with you uh, another new concept. Last time we discussed with you the concept of a set being spanning. I showed you one example to demonstrate this concept. Today we're going to consider, a, a, in, in a way, a complementary concept, which is called linear dependence and linear independence. It's another concept, it's, an, it's another new concept to you. Uh, underneath, I'm sorry, underneath that, and the, like with the spanning set, I hope you realize that, excuse me, I need your attention, everyone please. I can start getting friends again, but we can be quicker than that. Uh, underneath it, I mean, if, you, if, you getting any, uh, if you're getting understanding of a spanning idea, of a spanning concept we discussed with you last week, you realize by now, or you will realize soon, that it's a new name to, to the same thing you knew before, to the, to, the, to the way we consider systems of linear equations. I mean, when you address a particular issue, whether a set is spanning or not, it all boils down to solving a system of linear equations through row echelon form, through Gaussian elimination method, all these techniques you learn in the first semester. This new concept, linear dependence, uh, linear dependence and linear independence, eventually it will be the same thing. It's a new wrapping around the same technical procedure. Gaussian elimination and the row echelon forms. And it, it, like I said, to some extent, it's a complementing idea to the idea of, span, uh, of a set being spanning. So here's a formal definition. As before, we start in the context of a vector space, V my symbol for the vector space, I'll, I'll fix a set of vectors. Again, this idea of linear dependence or linear independence, it is relevant to a set of vectors as much as the idea of spanning set relevant to the idea of a set of vectors. So I take a set of vectors, x1 to xn. I'm going to call this set, or you're going to call this set, linear, uh, linearly independent if I'm sorry, linearly dependent. We're going to call the set linearly dependent if you can produce a set of numbers, a set of scalars, n scalars, one for each vector in a set, which work like that. The set, this set of scalars, it should work like this. If you take a linear combination of your vectors with this particular set of scalars, the result should be zero on one hand. And also, at the same time, or in fact, I should say, and at this, uh, also at the same time, such that not every in this set of scalars is zero. Because otherwise, I think it's a, it's a trivial observation. You can always take a set of zeros as a choice for your scalars. You can always build with these zeros this combination and you will end up with zero. It's a, nothing surprising in, this, in such a choice. But if, on the other hand, you are able through some skill, through some insight, or through some algorithm, come up with these scalars which not, such that not everyone in this set is zero and yet combination of the vectors with these scalars delivers zero, vec deliver zero vector, if you if you are able to do if you if you're able to do that, in that case you have the full right to call this set linearly dependent. That's the idea of something being linearly dependent. Linear linearly independent, it's an opposite idea, it's fully logical, opposite of that. So if you convince everyone that no matter how hard you try, you are unable to, to, you are unable to come up with, with, with such a set, which on the one hand works like this, and on the other hand not every element in that set is zero. If you convince everyone that you'll never be able to come up with such a set, then you have a right to call the set, the original set S, linearly independent. Set S is linearly independent, if and only if, Every linear combination of vectors which ends up zero delivers that every individual coefficient is zero, if and only if, you see. 
like I said, one way, this way it's a trivial observation. When you choose your zero coefficients, you, you, you don't have any options. Linear combination will be zero. But the other way around, that's, that's where the uh, options are. If you, the other way, it also works if the linear combination, just one single linear combination ensures that every coefficient is zero, it's a linear, linearly independent set. Otherwise, it is linearly dependent set. Okay, so like I said, it's a new concept. You need to, to, to invest some time and effort in, into understanding this concept. But on the other hand, you will realize, after you invest this time and effort, that under this concept, there will be the same procedure. Technically speaking, numerically speaking, it will be again some linking. You will find some connection of this idea to the raw echelon forms, Gaussian elimination, and all this routine Procedures you knew for, you know from the first semester. I'll show you one example to just to, to show this connection. In while while doing tutorial questions, you will you will strengthen that understanding. I hope. So one is one simple example. One simple example. These are canonical choice. As the this is something we call the standard. Uh, Oh, I'm not going to call it standard basis, actually, but, but, but okay, well, we, 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 this is a E1, E2, E3. It's a, it's a fixed standard notation for three vectors in R3 of the same, of this structure. So E1 is a vector like this. E2 is a vector like this. E3 is a vector like this. And I'm not sure if you... If you're aware that this is a fixed notation for this set of vectors, but that's the, it, it is this fixed notation for this set of vectors, E1, E2, and E3. Uh, for this three, we can, we can immediately see that this three, uh, as a set, uh, they make uh, a linearly independent set, because if I take a linear combination of this three, you see, I already wrote up a linear combination of these three vectors with some coefficients lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. If I make this assumption that this combination is zero vector, if I make such an assumption, the left-hand side, on the other hand, if you just add this up the way we add vectors, it will be the vector with three components. First component will be lambda 1, second component will be lambda 3, last component will be lambda, sorry, second component lambda 2, and the last component will be lambda 3. So the left-hand side, if you just do the arithmetic and you equate this to the right hand side in a, per com uh, a component by component, you will see that every lambda must be zero. That's the only way, that's the only way for this identity to work. There is no any other possible choice of lambdas which will make this identity work. This is so because of the nature of the vectors E1, E2, and E3. So every time this judgment, linear depend, linearly dependent or linearly independent, it will come from the nature of the vectors you're looking at. In, in case of E1, E2, E3 vectors, in case of these three vectors, given it's such a nice structure of these vectors, we see it immediately because the left-hand side basically it's a vector, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And that's why we conclude that this set is linearly independent. With the other vectors, it will require a little bit more work. And I'll show you this example as well. In fact, in fact, even if you consider similar vectors in a higher dimension, uh, in, in, a, in a higher vector spaces, I mean, if you take not R3, but say R4, in the setting of R4, or in fact, in the setting of Rn, in the setting of Rn, you can produce a similarly, similarly structured vectors where you take vector E1 will be 1, 0, 0, and the rest will be filled with zeros, as many as you need to cover all n tuple. E2 will be 0, 1, 0, and the rest will be filled with zeros, as many as you need to make it n-dimensional. The third one will be 0, 1, 0, and the rest again will be filled with zeros, as many as you need. The same logic works there as well, actually. I mean, the same logic will conclude that as long as soon as this, you have this, this identity with zeros as many as you need to make a zero vector in Rn, all of the lambdas will be... So in fact, these vectors, similarly structured vectors in the higher Rns, they also will be linearly independent. It's another example. 
The same logic, in fact, works in a complex n tuple space because you can think of this vector as a complex n tuple space. In that case, however, in that case, however, you, you need to think of lambdas as complex numbers because in this n tuple space, this f in my definition, it's no longer real numbers, it is now complex numbers, but still the same logic works. So this set, or similarly structured set, I should say, it is also linearly independent set in, even in this vector space. Okay, so this is, this is a simple example. Now I'll show you the mm, typical example from the yellow book. That's the example where we need to borrow our knowledge from the first semester. You will see this linkage a link, a disconnection with the row echelon forms and Gaussian elimination. Uh, yeah, that's right. We'll just look into that. Any questions in relation to this slide? Question? No? What, what you were stretching for? Tell us. Just what? Open, huh? Okay. Enjoy it then. Uh, Here's the example I chose. It's, it's from the yellow book. For this, um, I'm not sure how, if it's exactly from the yellow book or modeled on the, these examples in the yellow book. You will figure it out on your own. Um, okay, so the question, the question is straightforward. We need to test that the given set is, uh, we need to test whether the given set is linearly dependent or linearly independent. So the set given there is this set. It's a V1, it's a V2, it's a V3, and we have V4 as well. Four vectors, we need to test, or we need to make a decision whether it's linearly dependent or linearly independent. So we start off, we start off from the definition which says we need to consider linear combination of these four with some coefficients. And we need to see, I mean, so we need to consider linear combination of these four. Here it is. We need to equate this linear combination to zero, and now we need to make a decision, or we need to make an analysis, whether this combination zero all only with one possibility for the coefficients, or there are some extra possibilities, non-trivial possibilities for coefficients, which will make this identity work as well. Listen to this again. I just, I just repeat the, defin uh, the concept of linear, de linearly depend uh, linear dependence or linear independence. You, you start off from the identity like this with some yet unknown coefficients and the question you bothered with is this. You need to show whether you can come up with a non-trivial choice on the left hand side. Non-trivial meaning not, not, everyone, not everyone is zero, which makes it work. If you can, it is linearly dependent set. If you cannot, it's a linearly independent set. It's simple as this. On the, on, the, on the conceptual side. On the actual numerical side, when you start looking into this possibility of finding such lambdas, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, what are you going to do? Well, the natural step will be this. We take these numerical vectors we're given from the question, all of them in here. We just sub it in place of these, all of them individually. I'm not going to do it on the slide, but you can make a note of that. I will sub it in. I will do the arithmetic on the left-hand side as much as I did with my first example, E1, E2, E3 example. If you do this mental effort, if you do the, all of this, you sub in your V1, V2, V3, V4, all of the numbers given, and you do the arithmetic on the left-hand side, so you collect all of these individual vectors into one single vector of three components, what's you, what are you going to end up with? It will be one single vector of three components and each of the components, what, what, what kind of shape it will have? It will have a combination of these four numbers, of these four unknowns, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, with some of these coefficients. In fact, we can even predict, I, I, can, I, can give an, I can give you an even more exact description of what's going to happen. The first component of this giant vector on the left-hand side, it will be 1 times lambda 1 plus 3 times lambda 2, plus 4 times lambda 3, plus 2 times lambda 4. That's the complete first component of this one single vector on the left-hand side. 
Similarly, second component will be negative 3 times lambda 1, 2 times lambda 2, negative 1 times lambda 3, 5 times lambda 4. And I can tell you the same, thing, or I'm sure at this stage maybe most of you can tell me the third component at the same time. Uh, what, what's that? The third component of this giant vector on the left hand side. Now, what's important here from the conceptual point, if you now again remember the question we're heading to, or yes, we're answering to, the question says this whether we can come up with a non trivial choice of lambda which makes this work. If you now re rethink this, this question in, in, the, in, the, in the context of this one single large vector on the left hand side and a zero vector on the right hand side, it just comes down to whether we can find a solution to the system of linear equations, non-trivial solution to the system of linear equations. And the matrix of this system of linear equations, here it is. The matrix of this system of linear equations is the one which is built of these V vectors as columns. That's the V1, it's the V2, it's the V3, and that's the V4. And this is a very typical case of studying linear for linear dependence and linear independence. There are some, some more advanced cases. They're not so uh, ubiquitous across the yellow book. Most of the time, that's all there is to it. You, most of the time, ever, you will be looking at a set of vectors, and eventually you will reduce it to answering the question whether a system of linear equations has a non-trivial solution or, or only trivial solution. It's a homogeneous system, isn't it? It's a system which has zero on the right hand side. So for such a system, we always have a solution, trivial solution, zero solution. And the question goes to ask whether we have another one, a non-trivial one. And we know how to answer that. That's where the techniques from the first semester comes in and helps us, help us, sorry. How do we answer that question? How do we answer the question whether a system of a homogeneous system of linear equation has a unique trivial solution or many other non-trivial solutions. We need to take this we need to take the matrix to the row echelon form and see how many pivots we have in that. Is that what the first semester tells us? Well, if you master this, I understanding this connection between the first first semester techniques and this new concept of linear dependence and independence, that's all you need to know about that. I'll finish the question again as before. I'm not going to take you, I'm not going to spend your time or waste your time by doing actual row echelon form reduction or Gaussian elimination. I'll just tell you what that will be. Uh, if you care, uh, so I pre computed this. This is a row echelon form of this matrix. If you want to double check me, I think I just put here the, all of the operations, row operations I, I used to do this reduction. Four operations, if you care. It's not really that of, of, uh, of great importance right now for the present discussion, but if you want to double check me, you can do that. So here we are. We reduced my matrix to the row echelon form. Now let's just look back at the question. The question was, do we have a non-trivial solution to the system like this? What will be your judgment? Do we have it or we don't have it? Where is Kerry? I know a friend in this class whose name is Kerry. Do, is, is he present? He eh? He's supposed to scare. That's not a manly behavior. Uh, <laughs> what about uh, Richard? He was very good last time helping me. Richard, do we have Richard? No? Oh, come on, another one who is gone. That's nice. Uh, Matthew. He's, he's not here as well. I love it. Uh, what's the next one? I met a fellow on Monday. His name was... Oh, bug, I forgot. All right, Tim. Uh, Tim, I see. <laughs> tell me, what your knowledge of the first semester tell, tells you? I don't exactly remember. <laughs> I didn't catch the answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you got nothing to say. 
All right, we, we judge by, by looking how many pivots the matrix has. This, in this particular case, we have one and two, two pivots or two leading columns and two non-leading columns. And that's the, when we have non-leading columns in the, homog in, in the homogeneous system, it means we have multiple solutions, non-zeros, there are non-zero solutions. In fact, you can obtain them by just setting random values to the variables attached to the, to the last two columns and then solving for the first two columns. Any random, uh, randomly chose two, two values for the last two columns or for the two variables of last two columns will make system work. For instance, I think I made a choice here. Here we go. If I choose, if I choose the, uh, lambda 3, 1 and lambda 4, 0, so if I make it to this choice in this system, I can solve for the unknowns for the first two columns. Lambda 2 solution will come from this line. And solution will be negative 1. Because it's just, that's, that's how you solve it. 7 of lambda 2s equal negative, of lambda, negative 7 of lambda 3s and negative 7 of lambda 4s. And then you solve for the lambda 1 from the first line. Again, you solve it like this. You got one here. I mean, you got uh, one of the, you, you got this, lambda, lambda 1 equal negative 3 of lambda 2, negative 4 of lambda 3, and negative 2 of lambda 4, if you solve for that. And here's the four values, four values for my unknowns lambdas. If you test them now directly, here, or even if you test them here, they, they're going to work. Look at this. Let's just try it. Um, I'm going to try this. So lambda 1 is negative 1, right? So here we have negative 1. Here I have negative 1 again. Here I have 1. And here I have 0. So these are the values for my unknowns, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. If I try them against this system, what's going to look, look what's going to happen. Negative 1 times 1, this one. It's negative 1. Negative 3 plus 4 gives you 0. This line gives me plus 3, take 2, take 1, 0. This line gives me uh, plus 2, take 1, take 1, 0. You can even test it with the vectors itself. Look at this. this. If I take this number next to V1, if I take this number next to V2, if I take this number next to V3, and if I take this number next to... Oh, it was a mistake to take it like that. If I take this number next to V4, you can, take, you can test it even like this. If I, combine now, if I combine my vectors V1, V2, V3 with these numbers, with this 4, once again, if you combine that, it will be negative 1 and times 1, negative 1. Negative 1 times 3, negative 3. 1 times 4 plus 4, it is 0. It's the same test I did here in, on the matrix. If you take these numbers across the second set of components, 0 again. You take these numbers against the last set of components, it is 0. So this one works with this choice of numbers. So... In fact, now I can conclude that my set of vectors is linearly dependent because I presented quite explicitly, I presented quite explicitly a set of coefficients, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, negative 1, negative 1, 1, and 0. That's my presentation, which make this combination 0, even not everyone is here, is 0. This is, the, this is the exactly the evidence which delivers the conclusion. The set of vectors is linearly dependent. In fact, in fact, even if I gave you this free set of numbers, these four numbers out of the blue without doing these pre-computations, that again will be enough evidence. It's just this pre-computation. Most of the time you can't guess them, this fact, this number, these values. Most of the time you need to do these pre-computations to find these numbers. But just having these numbers and doing the tests, it's already enough evidence to conclude the set, that the set is linearly dependent. If you remember your first year, first semester stuff, we could have come up with another choice for these numbers. I mean, remember, I started, 
uh, I started my computation of this, I start, started by finding these numbers by saying I randomly set variables for the last two columns to the values of my preference. And my preference was one and zero. On the other hand, my preference could have, could have been zero and one. That's not a quite nice preference. If I take these two across this system, across this row channel form, and I, if I solve for the first two, I pre-solve it, the values it will come up it will be these two, negative one, one, zero, and one. If you now test, test uh, sorry, if I take this four now, if, and if you test them again against your four vectors, they will also work. Look at this, this one should be, so this time is one, negative one, one, and zero, so this time this will be this time this will be one, this stays negative one, this is zero, and this comes with the coefficient one. That's another set of, uh, set of numbers. If you test this new set, one, negative one, zero, and one, against these four vectors, if you combine them like this, I show you, assure you there will be zero. Let's just try. First component, one and one, one, 3 and negative 1, it's negative 3. 4, 0, gone. Plus 2, exactly 0. The other two components work the same. So this example actually shows you that it is very typical. It is very typical when you, if you happen to find a set of coefficients, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, which not everyone is 0, but they make the combination 0, it's very typical that this, this, this choice of coefficients, it's not unique. There will be other choices. In, in fact, there will be plenty of the other choices. And I'll show you this in a second. It's very typical when you have a set of linearly dependent vectors, the set of coefficients which vanish this set, it's a, it's a, it's a whole uh, infinite sub, subspace of, of coefficients. Right. Any questions? All right. So what we just discovered with you, if you take this, if you take this combination with the particular choice of lambdas, we just discovered that here it is. It is zero. And here's another combination which is which corresponds to this set of numbers. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, what we discovered with you, at, well, that's what we discovered with you. We discovered these two particular relations, these two particular combinations of V1, V2, V3, and V4, which deliver zeros. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, each of these relations I can solve for V3 and V4. Look at this. This one, if I solve it, I can express my V3 like this. In here, I can express my V4 like this. So in fact, in fact, what we discovered is this. We discovered that I'll use my language, or I'll use our new language from our earlier meetings, that the V3 vector in the span of V1 and V2 vectors, isn't it? If vector is expressible as a, as a linear combination of another set of vectors, we can use this new name or new, new way of saying it. it. It belongs to the span of those two. So these two lines, we just discovered, we just, we just come up after solving these two identities for v, v3 and v4. In my new language, they tell me that both v3 and in fact v4 as well, In fact, V4 as well, they belong to the span of the V2 and V1 alone, without v, V3 and V4. Further thing which I can say from this one single analysis, and I'm saying this because this, this has, this will typically happen in many, on many, in, in many examples. Uh, another thing I can say is this. 
if I reduce my set, I mean, my original set was of four vectors, isn't it? My original set was of, of four vectors. If I reduce this set to only two vectors, the first two vectors, V2, so V1 and V2, and I ask the same question, whether this reduced set of two vectors is linearly dependent or linearly independent, what's going to happen? Well, I would need to follow the same steps, the steps I did for four vectors, V1, V2, V3, V4. I would need to build the same system. This time, this time, the system will have only two columns in this matrix. The other two are gone because V3 and V4 were tossed away. I will need to take this smaller system to the row echelon form. It will be the same set of operations. Nothing has changed. It will be this matrix only, half of it, for the row echelon form. If you refer back to the techniques of the first semester, you will see that this time, solution will be unique. Because you have two pivots, two leading columns, and none of the non-leading columns in the smaller matrix. So the only solution to this system is trivial solution. So of this reduced set of V2 and V3, the only solution is a trivial solution. There is no any other choice for lambda 1 or lambda 2 beside this trivial choice, which will make this identity work. It comes from the fact that this smaller matrix, it has only leading columns. It has two pivots and two columns. So this smaller set, the smaller set, this, the set of V2 and V1 alone, is in fact linearly independent set. That's another thing which will happen very often. If you have a set which is linearly dependent, you can always reduce it to a smaller set which will become linearly independent. Any questions? All right, I think we can benefit even more from this example. We're done with this part of the computations, but there's a further thing. Let me just throw in an extra vector, this one. I'm going to call it the vector A. And let me just go back to our discussion from last week when we discussed with you spanning sets. What I'm going to say, uh, what I'm going to ask is this. What is it possible to find a linear combination of my, again, four vectors, V1, V2, and V3, and V4, which deliver no longer zero vector, but my A vector, the one I just introduced? If this is the case, if this is the case, I can, that will be, in, again, in my new language, it will mean that A vector belongs to the span of four, V1, V2, V3, V4. The example I showed you last week, it just tells you, basically, again, it's about system of linear equations. We need to build a system of linear equations. On the left-hand side, that will be a matrix which composed of V1, V2, V3, V4 as columns. Oops, sorry. As columns, so, oh, what the heck. As this matrix. On the right-hand side, it, is, it will be my A vector. So here's the matrix we're looking at now. It's the same matrix on the left-hand side as before. On the right-hand side, now we have some non-trivial right-hand side, my A matrix, A vector. Here it is. Again, techniques from the first semester. And remember, we're looking for whether we have a solution to this system. Techniques from the first semester, what do they say? There is a solution. That's something we discussed last week. If you, if you take this to the row echelon form, it will be solvable row echelon form. Row echelon form here, I pre-computed that. Here it is. It's the same set of operations as it was here. Well, actually, no. It's not the same. It's almost the same because here you've got the row of sevens. Here's the row of ones. So, in fact, I, I did one extra operation. I just normalized the second row by seven. So, if you take this, these operations from this, from this side and you've uh, made another one, just one extra operation, that will make this row echelon form. So, by looking at this system, and by referring to the first semester techniques, I can see that no pivot present on the right-hand side. This system is solvable 
And so the answer is yes, there is a set of coefficients lambda which deliver such right-hand side. So yes, A belongs to the span of V1, V2, and V3, and V4. Yes, the answer to this question is tr true. What I will do next now, I will take it a little bit further. I will try to find the exact values for these coefficients, which deliver A. And this time, this time, I'll do it in full generality. So I will find all possible coefficients, which works like that. It's again, basically, it's the first semester stuff. What we need to do, we need to parameterize. Uh, we need to parameterize the unknowns corresponding to uh, non-leading columns. So here's my parameterization. I'll just give names or give parameters, parameter values to my unknowns corresponding to the non-leading columns. And then I solve for the rest. So, for instance, if I solve for lambda 3, I use the second row here to solve for lambda 3. This is uh, for lambda 2, sorry. Here's a solution. 3, take t, it's for this one, and take s, which is for the second one. That's a solution for lambda 2. When I go for lambda 1, I will use the first row for the solution. And here is solution 8 from here. Take double s, it's for this 2. Take 4t, four, uh, four this is for this 4. Take 3 and 3, and then the whole lambda 2. Here it is. If you just pretty, if you simplify it a little bit, that's the expression for lambda 1. We we, this is the complete solution in the parametric form. This is something you did a lot in the first semester. But I did this with this much details, which is once in a while, why not? Uh, to just show you what gonna, what's going to happen next. So, if you look back at the question I try to answer, I try to describe all of these coefficients which make this identity work, and here they are, all of them. If I parameterize, if I take any random values for the first, for the, for the last two, the first two, they will come up through this formula. All of them will, will be of this, of this structure. What I will do next, next is this. I, I'm going to take these value now, values now, and I'm going to put them in here in these places. Because I want to see how, how T and S, they actually, how they work in this identity on the, on the left hand side. Look at this. So, A, which is from here, now I'm substituting. For lambda 1, I'm, I, I, I substitute the value we have just found in terms of T and S. That's a substitution, V1. For lambda 2, oh, sorry, for, for, the, yeah, for lambda 2, I substitute the value we have found here. V2, and for lambda 3 and lambda 4, it's a very easy substitution. It's T and S substitution. This is a general look of this representation, which always works. No matter which choice for T and S you make, that will make this identity true, numerical or vector identity. Why did I do that? Because look what's going to happen. Look, what, look, look what's going to happen. If you look carefully through this identity, in fact, if you do the expansion in the first two terms, if you do the expansion, look, what, look, what, look what's happening. Uh, well, I need actually, well, interesting happens, interesting thing actually happens, but I need to just move it a little bit like this. I need to remember these two things, remember these two things we discovered in the first part of our discussion. Yeah, actually, let's just do it like this. Actually, I, I, I realize I do have these details. If I do the expansion, let me just do the expansion. Uh, the purpose of my expansion is to combine all T's together and all S together. Here's the combination. Negative V1 plus 3 V2. It's this negative V1 plus this 3. Now goes all of the T's. This T with V1, V2, V1, this T with V2, and this T with V3. And all of the S together, 
this s with v1, this s with v2, and this s with v3. All of them here now. And now I can move the slide to the left. I mean, to the right, actually, to open what's on the left-hand side, because if I move it like this, look at these two relations we discovered with you before. These two relations we discovered with you before, and you can see these combinations exactly in these two brackets, next to T and next to S. It's not a coincidence. It's a very deep, deep mechanics in the linear dependence and the linear independence we just worked. So in these expansions we just done, both all T's and S, they all disappear because of these two things. And we end up with, just as, with a relation as simple as this. All right, so let's just put this computational side aside. You will have a time to, to get through this once again and think for the numbers or, or computational manipulations we've done. Let's just think about this globally. Globally, what we were trying to do is this. We were trying to answer the question whether this A belongs to the span of these four vectors. In the attempt to answer that question, we realized it does belong to the span of these four vectors. Not only that, the, there are plenty of choices for lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4 to make it belong to the span. Plenty of choices. All of them are listed here. But what we further realize is that out of this plenty of choices, we actually can express A as a linear combination of only first two in here. The other two are redundant. Yes, the answer is true. We can express A as a linear combination of four. But in fact, A is something which is expressible as a linear combination of only first two. And the first two, if you remember, again, the discussion on the, on the left-hand side of my slide, they were such that they were linearly independent. That's another very key observation which you're going to see very often. If you have a set of, of linearly dependent vectors, you're feeling well, right? Uh, if you have a set of linearly dependent vectors, you can reduce it to a smaller set all the time, which is linearly independent, and you can do it without damage to how much vectors you can span with the set. Everything you can span with the original four, everything you can span with the original four will also be spannable with a smaller reduced set. This is something of key importance, and that's a, that's a very uh, at the core of the idea of linear dependence and linear independence, and you will need to do this on many occasions to find the smaller set within the larger set, which is on one hand linearly independent, and on the other hand it does it does reduce uh, sorry it delivers the same amount of span as the original set, like we did just now. And the method of finding that it's exactly on this slide. You need to bring the matrix to the row which you form. And you need, to choose the, you need to choose those vectors which correspond to the leading columns of your row echelon form. Any questions? OK. We still have four minutes. Uh, we still have four minutes, let alone the time which is sitting on your accounts, which I can claim back from, from our earlier classes, which we finished earlier. But Probably we won't need that. Four minutes will be enough. Uh, okay. Well, this this sort of reasoning we just discussed with you. I don't know how well. Like probably you so you see it for the first time. It doesn't really settle in your minds yet. But when it settles, you will realize the importance of these particular sets of vectors, which on one hand linearly independent, like in here and on the other hand delivers the required span. So they are spanning in some sets. So the sets which combine both properties, linearly independent and span, we have a special name for them. We call them basis or vector spaces, and that's the last slide I'm going to discuss with. It's a pure terminology slide. Uh, and that, that would be a good point to finish. Let's just look into that. So again, it's a terminology slide. Basis: if you have a vector uh, set of, uh, sorry, if you have a vector space, it's a general setting. You have a set of vectors, 
set of uh, a finite set of vectors within your vector space. You're going to call this set basis. You're going to call this set basis if two things are met. First one, B is linearly independent. And the second one, B is spanning. That's the, that's the term from the last week. And I, that this is the explanation of this term. It means that the whole vector space is, in fact, equals, in, sorry, equal, in fact, equals to the to the span of this set. In that case, we're gonna call it basis. Further to that, further to terminology, if you just expand this idea a little bit, if you just expand this idea a little bit. Because, all right, if I take a vector in my vector space, I call it A, given that my B set is spanning, I can always uh, expect that my A will be representable as a linear combination of my vectors. That's the, that's the spanning piece. Not only, yeah, it's, that, that, that's a spanning piece. This set of coefficients, this set of coefficients, which realize this presentation of A as a linear combination of elements of B, it will have a special name as well. So this set of coefficients, we're going to call them the, I'm going to, I'm going to call this the n-tuple. That's the symbol we're going to use for this set of coefficients. This is a symbol. And we're going to call it coordinate vector of A with respect to the basis B. With respect to the basis B. It's a two new terms. It's a two, these are two new terms, uh, which inspired by my example. Uh, I'll take another minute of your time just to, to, to just make one extra demonstration of these two new terms, and then uh, you'll have rest. Uh, so once again, the basis is the one which is linearly independent and spanning at the same time. And when you have a basis, when you have a basis, a set of coefficients which realize a vector with respect to that basis, we call it coordinate vector of this A with respect to that basis. If I take you back to the example we just did, if I take you back to that example, In the light of these new terms, I can say that the collection of these two vectors within my large set of four is, in fact, basis. Not for the whole space, but it is basis for, this, for the four span of B. And given this representation, given this representation, I can say that the coordinates of my A with respect to this basis is negative one, and three. Negative one came from here, three came from here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, oh, do you have any questions first? Okay, then thank you very much for your patience again. Thank you very much for that.